Hi there, I'm Karen Dunn of KMD Productions. From the equipment manufacturers to the engineers to the business people behind the scenes. Over the years, every member of the Pro Audio Corner of the music industry have become family to me. And it's my job to bring the whole eclectic crew together. Each episode, I'll introduce you to one of these characters and open a window into my world of creating community in Pro Audio. Thanks for tuning in to One and Done. Join us today is restaurateur and mixing engineer, Manny American. Manny, thanks for coming. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, we've been talking about doing this for, for a little bit and I'm glad we, uh, we're here. Yeah, thank well, you. you're definitely worth the wait. And I think, so I've done 14 episodes so far and I think it took the longest to get you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I knew it was always going to happen. It's just, I know you're really busy, so. I'm sorry. I'm no, 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 no. It's good. Um, so first I want to talk about verse. It, yeah. I I went one time. Well, let's go back. When, first yeah, I went when, time. So, you, you were there when we did, uh, gosh, were you there at one of the events that we you, had? I think it was a soft launch. And I was there with a bunch of Audio Technica people. And it was like a 21 course tasting menu. Oh, so you went to, okay, so we called that intro. Oh, clever. Okay. Right? <laughs> so that was intro. That was our, in our gallery that we put together. Yeah. Long table of 20. But you got to come to actually to Verse Verse, which is yes. Really yes. a studio and built a studio big enough to put a restaurant in it. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's a simple concept, but yeah, much, you know, but yet complicated. So uh, the thought was how can we have a, a, rest, uh, a studio big enough to house a restaurant? You know, and uh, in a bar <laughs> and then be witnesses to recording because uh, you know people ask me why a restaurant and i mean i asked myself why a restaurant <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was more about capturing content i mean it's simply just uh having a platform for musicians to come in be recorded in a live environment i mean it's kind of that simple and uh, to be able to do it at a very, very high level, you know, and uh, listen, uh, I know this may sound a little cheesy, but a community that's given me so much is maybe just me giving back that much uh, to the artist community so that they can have a place where they can feel safe and comfortable and know that they're going to get quality content back. Right, you know? right. I follow you on Instagram and uh, and I'm also on your mailing list for Verse. So I see you have lots of theme nights. You have yeah. karaoke night, you all gotta, this kind of stuff. I think it's amazing. And the jazz people that I've seen that you have bring in, it, yeah. just, it just all seems to go so well. And it's so unobtrusive, but just really seems to complete the whole experience of being there. So, yeah. It, yeah. Go, go, go ahead. So are, are you, are you a foodie? I mean, why? Are you interested in food? Because your food is amazing. Yeah, you know, we're getting great reviews on the food. Uh, I think I've always been, a, I think we're all foodies in a way, you know, like uh, we, uh, you know, a few years ago, maybe five, six years ago, I, you know, I've been mixing for a long, long time. And you ask any mixer what's the hardest thing to do is sometimes finding just inspiration because sometimes you get the same song if you have a hit doing this genre, then everyone thinks that that's all you can do. And, uh, and I always believe not, you know, to not be boxed in, right? Like pigeonholed. And, and uh, I've been very conscious of that uh, throughout my mixing career where I take on projects that you probably wouldn't normally take on. But just to, you know, you got to have that fun and still be passionate about it. So right. a few years ago, I just, I don't know. I, mean, I wasn't going to quit or anything. I loved what I do, but I wasn't as inspired, you know, and uh and then this opportunity presented itself, and long story short, I kind of, you know, my mom always says, uh, "Mijo, <laughs> follow your passion," like everyone, like every mom, every parent. Right. So I thought, okay, what are my passions? I mean, I've been living in this music studio my entire career. What are my passions? And and I, music is still my my passion. Uh, and I and I just not discovered, but I reminded myself of like you know traveling. We love to travel, right? Mm -hmm. And when we travel, we go to wine regions and restaurants. So it's like, oh, well, it's food, music, and drinks. And, you know, so there you go. So the trifecta, you know, follow your passion. And then this presented itself. And I kind of just needed uh, some inspiration. And, oh, boy, did I get it. <laughs> More than inspiration. And, uh, and that's kind of how it came about, you know. 
So I don't know any other studio that has a restaurant attached to it. Is are right. you unique that way? I mean, <laughs> it's such a great idea, but it's not something I see a lot of studios doing. You know, it's tough. I mean, it's really, really hard to execute. If you can imagine, like everyone has been presented at least at some point of their lives to open up a restaurant or invest in the restaurant or be. And you always see the you hear the classic stories like they people always lose their money. It's not a, you know it's not a good business model. It's a very low margin, high volume, high volume, low margin, and there's a lot of room for error on that. Mm-hmm. So it's not easy. It's a it's a it's it's not it's tough, and you gotta you know. Um, so I I think that's why people are not crazy enough to go into that business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so you took a chance, basically, because you yeah. don't know if it's going to work. A lot of studios are condensing because they're trying to cut costs. You added a huge cost yeah. with a restaurant because there's so much. And now food prices are skyrocketing because of all the pandemic, all that kind of stuff. But you yeah. t- took a chance. There are going to be 99 people who are going to say no. Mm-hmm. But you said yes. So saying yes to something that's so different and kind of groundbreaking is so hard and so many people won't. So why did you say yes? What's in you that makes you do that? I think it's just naiveness. I don't know. Uh, um, I, I, I Again, it was, I knew it was going to be challenging. I, in the beginning, I was supposed to be the music guy. And my partner was supposed to be the business guy. And of course, classic story, you know. Uh, didn't work out, so it took me a while to kind of get rid of him and restructure the uh, the business model, so to speak. And I think it was just about look. There's a point in everyone's lives that they just want a new challenge and they want to see what what you can do with it. And and uh, you know, one thing I discovered about myself in this whole process is, man, I just can't half-ass anything. You know, I, I tried. Believe me, I tried. It would have been a lot easier. <laughs> right. But uh, for better or worse, I just learned that I just got to put 150%. If not, I'm not happy or content. So, um, I, you know, again, I think it's just being a little naive into thinking that everything's going to be fine. And, and then you get in it and it's not. And then you go for a couple of years and fix it and try to make it good. And uh, I, uh, again, I, my intention was not to be a restaurateur. My intention was always to be just someone that captures content and just still in the music industry, you know? Right, so, right. So, for yeah. me, so the concept of having a restaurant for someone like myself, people are confused, but it really is a place where it kind of, kind of matches it's, what, what, what I've been doing. It, with. So it's an extension of what yeah. you're doing. It's just like another it's, creative form. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's an extension of that. And uh, we just happen to serve food and drinks with it. Uh-huh. Know? <laughs> so did you have any hand in the design? Because Jules, who you met earlier, one of my producers, um, went to your restaurant, I think in uh, December. And oh. we were we were just talking about how it's like a studio because there's so many studios you don't know that they're studios unless mm-hmm. you know, right? So your restaurant is kind of that same mm-hmm. vibe. So was that intentional? Very intentional. I mean, I, I again, I was very involved. I, I, I feel like every corner, everything in that place has a little bit something from my heart you know mm-hmm. so uh for better or worse again you know there's you know the colors the uh, the, the palette the uh the uh, the actual design on the libra panels uh, you know the beams where we the, the cut uh, everything the wallpaper the bathrooms the uh, art the art um and again going back to uh, you know i always said if this fails right mm-hmm. uh, and i I, I'll never be able to, well, I, I don't want to say never, but I'd be really hard on myself if I let it fail of me not having been more involved, really involved. So I, I said, look, I'm just going to go in 100%. And if, if, it, if it fails, then I know that I gave it my heart and soul. And I can, I can definitely live with that. But, it, mm-hmm. if, but if I let someone else do it and it fails, then I'll never... You know, it'll be hard to forgive myself. Right. Yeah. So that's that's that that was a concept. And I said, look, for better or worse, let me just go in and kind of get my what's in my head and see if somebody can help me achieve it. Uh, I had a lot of help. I can't take all the credit myself with the design. A friend of mine, Kimberly Bill Schmidt, helped me and we sourced a lot of different things. And 
on the audio side, obviously Meyer constellation system is the best system in the world. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I had a lot, definitely a lot of help. It takes, you know, it takes a village, right? Right. Definitely. Um, is your, I want to talk a little bit about your career, but before then you talked about how you have to give everything 150%. Is that true? I'm assuming it's true with all your mixes too, right? There's, do you ever achieve that perfection that you're looking for? You know, yes. Yeah, funny because perfection is, you know, that's such a funny word I get uh, when it comes to being creative, right? Um, you know, I try, uh, and what I have learned in the last, whatever, 25 plus years is, uh, you know, we're here as a mixer. We're here to satisfy the client. I mean, that's, it's, you know, that simple. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, so for me, perfection is something that I don't know if it, it exists, but in, in my mind, it, there's so many things that go through your mind while you're doing a, a mix, even it could be a simple mix. Uh, trying to almost satisfy your soul, ego, whatever that is, right? Mm-hmm. At the same time, you're thinking of your client. Well, well what are they? And, and ultimately, you're ultimately you're also thinking about who's going to listen to this. <clears throat> and that's a combination that's always always in your mind as you're doing the work, right? So I always talk about the, the left brain, right brain, on how they switch right. off at, at every moment so that you can hopefully achieve whatever that perfection is. And sometimes perfection is satisfying the client and you not being 100% satisfied with a mix, right? And other times it's you closing your eyes and this song moving you and then you listen to the rough and it doesn't move you the same way, right? Right. Um, so yeah, it's a complicated question. Uh, I, I think that we're all searching for perfection at all times, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm definitely that way with my events and it's hard to ever attain, but for me, I want to try to be perfect. Mm-hmm. I know for every event, and I'm sure you've noticed with like with the restaurant or with your mixes, there's something that's going to go wrong. So yeah. part of being trying to strive for perfection is knowing something's going to go wrong, dealing with it and just moving on and not letting that sidetrack you. Mm-hmm. And listen, the food and beverage business is <clears throat> the perfect example of that because I, uh, I feel like my job there is putting fires out constantly. Uh, that's, that's my job. You know, it's not it's not even about coming up with creative things, but we do that as well. But it's putting out fires every day. There's a fire, and I think you have to have that mindset, or else it'll break you down. You know, yeah. or, else, or else you'll you're just gonna give up. Yeah. Uh, you know, how much of how much of yourself do you give to every situation, every fire that you got to put out? Oh, so and so his his uh he just got into a car accident. He's our main server tonight, and without this person, we have two hundred covers. We may fail on <laughs> this server. Mm-hmm. It's like, right. okay, well, how do we put that fire out? How do we fix this? How how do we pivot? How do we adapt? And I think that if anything, the restaurant business has taught me <clears throat> so much. And in, in, as a mixer, I mean, uh, you know, adapt adapting is the key. You know, uh, yeah. I, and, and and one thing that will prevent you from growing, I think, in any business is your ego. Like, right? If you think about it, your ego is the one that's going to kind of prevent you from growing because you're going to think that, I don't know, you're the best or you're good or your decisions or you're are always right. And, you know, that's the ego getting in the way. And in the restaurants, you have to be so humble to say, you know what? I tried it. It didn't work because the numbers don't lie. Uh, as right. opposed to as opposed to a mixer, look, I did it my way, and you don't see the numbers. I mean, yeah, it may become a hit, it may not be, become a hit, but you know, I don't know if mixers think that way. Maybe they do, but I feel like the restaurant business has has taught me to, you know, or reminded me to always be conscious of, you know, hey, are you doing it the right way? And and if it, and if not, then you gotta adapt. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems to me like with a restaurant, you have a vision, and so you can move toward to trying to achieve that vision. In music, you're trying to achieve someone else's vision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's let's say a huge difference. Huge, huge difference. And and you know, and, and and I feel like when they do call you to mix, right? They're you know they're calling you for for an opinion. Honestly, they're just saying, hey, we respect your opinion on music, whether 
the way it sounds, the way it feels, whatever that is. They're calling you for for an opinion, and you just show them, right? You don't, you don't tell them, hey, I think you should try this or that. No, you right, just do right. it and you show them, and hopefully that that vision kind of aligns with what ultimately their vision. Is. Right. So, and then if it doesn't, then you work at it until you get it. So I think maybe the first time we met was with Pensado's place. Yeah. Um. And, and I th- I remember when Herb he had he wanted me to. He had this certain vision in his head of how he wanted the event to go. Um, And it was a way I had never done an event before. And it was just a a portion of it. And so I said, I don't think it's going to work, but Mm -hmm. this is what I think you should do instead. And he said, no, I want to do it my way. So (laughs) so I said, which, you know, Herb, of course, is going to say that. And so it was such a huge challenge because I didn't think it would work, but I wasn't going to say no. Because it's a challenge, and I love challenges. I mean, they make me nuts. They stress me out. But if you can achieve that challenge, you know, if you can conquer it, then it's the coolest feeling. So, so I would think as a mixer that you get challenges that way. That that yes, you, artists come to you because they want a certain sound, and and maybe you've done something they liked, and they want to be that way. But you know, like there must be times you're doing stuff that you don't think is right. Mm-hmm. So is it something like in the events, I'll tell my client, I don't think this is right. I, or I can't, you know, you should do it this way. And they say, no, then I say, great, we'll just go with your way. So is that something that you have to deal with as a mixer? Yeah. You know, I always uh, gauge the temperature. Like if, for example, on a, on a scale from one to 10, like how, like if you don't agree, say with something, right. It, on a scale from one to 10, where would you put this, this specific scenario or and i would say if it's closer to a 10 if it's a 10 i definitely voice my opinion Mm -hmm. it's like a five and i let them go through that journey you know uh, because i think part of it is they have to go through that journey as well it's not even about being right or wrong it's about right just trying something so so i have to be really careful on what that number is (laughs) because if it's a if i do feel it's a 10 then i say look respectfully, you know, I, this is the reason why I don't think it may work. Uh, I mean, it just happened the other day. We were doing this record with Pharrell, and Pharrell kept saying, hey, man, I want to just keep bringing it up. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to tell you, our luffs <laughs> were really loud. And it's we're kind of working backwards because when we service it to the DSPs, they're going to actually bring it down, and your record will sound mm-hmm. lower than everybody else. So in a way, we're doing the complete opposite. We should be bringing it down so that we can sound <clears throat> competitive. And he thought about it and he's like, you know what? Okay. All right. I, I, let's, let's roll with that. So to me, that's a 10, like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but if, if Pharrell goes, man, you know what? Let's, let's bring that 808 up and EQ it a certain way so that it does this, this and that. And even if I don't agree with that, to me, it's like you have to go through that process and show them and yourself. Because the most common mistake I feel in the creative environment is your ego. Again, you'll say, no, nah, it's not going to work. <laughs> You're like, how do you know? Wow, it's just not right. gonna work. Uh, but you haven't heard it. How do you know if it's not going to work? Mm-hmm. And we hear that all the time, right? And for me, it's more practical of like, all right, let's try it. Let's see. And, and, and I got to say, I've learned way more from doing that than the latter, you know? Uh, and again, it's, and, and, and you just keep learning, keep learning like, yeah. Oh, okay. If I did this, this and that, I get that type of result. Let me store that in this, you know, in this hard drive. <laughs> and hopefully I, I'll, if I need it later, I can pull it up and, and I can hopefully save another scenario like this, that, you know, that's not quite as, ready to you know to verbalize or you know i can just do it right yeah i want to keep talking about mixing except i'm way like past where i'm supposed to be when asking you (laughs) questions um so i know that you came to la when you were nine your uh family's from guatemala guatemala yeah uh we came here at nine uh mom brought my sister and i we got on the pan am 747 first time on the plane i got it, you know, I, I thought I was going to throw up. And, and uh, as soon as we got here, her intention was never to go back. But she did tell us we were coming, we were, we were going to go to Disneyland. 
Did you go to Disneyland? They're like, we haven't, we've been here three months. We haven't seen the <laughs> so, so this day, I always, I always say, uh, hey, we're still on vacation, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, but yeah, um, if you came, we came at the perfect window where uh, I remember Ronald Reagan going on national television saying, look, if you came between this, you know, this date, um, you're granted. Uh, he didn't say political asylum, but basically that's what it was. So, yeah. so we ended up staying here. We got, you know, we got a green card right away because they America felt bad of all the <laughs> bad things that they did to those poor countries, and uh-huh. yeah, they came to LA. So, and uh, m- mom put 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 us in uh, English school on a Monday. We landed on a Thursday. Monday, we're like, why are we going to school? She's like, oh, if you speak English when we go back, you'll get better jobs. We're like, all right. <laughs> And here we are. So um, my mom is, uh, she was a first generation here. She came from North Africa, to, uh, went to school in Mexico City, and then moved here. So wow. I can't imagine with her background and all her uncles were like doctors and teachers and that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. you being the first kid here from yeah. your, was that going into music? I, I know that drumming, you were like a really good drummer and you went to the special high school, but was that a path that your mom thought was a good idea? I mean, were she, was she encouraging? Is that what she wanted? No, you know, I, you know, we grew up in <clears throat> some not so great neighborhoods, you know, single mom, you know, uh, she was a nurse back home trying to make ends meet with two kids. So uh, she, I gotta say she was the most supportive mom. We used to, you know, we used to live in like one bedroom apartments and, mm-hmm. My drum set for half. half of the <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I got the most patient mom and sister. So they really, um, it, it was just a lot of support, you know. I mean, as a, I can't imagine what she was going through because we never really talked about it. But I, I'm sure now as a parent, I'm like, I don't even think about what the expectation either for my kids. I'm like, look, they're gonna be who they are, and if you if I set an expectation, then I'm I'm most likely gonna be disappointed, right? Uh, just because not necessarily. How old are your kids? Uh, 20 and 18. Oh, okay. Never mind then. (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) you know, so, so I can't imagine what she was going through, but she, she was always supportive. I told her early on that I wanted to do music. And again, I, I think drum playing drums, you know, really kept me out of trouble, you know, because again, we weren't in the greatest of neighborhoods. I can't mm-hmm. say in the hood or, you know, but, uh, but you know, there's some bad kids around that you hang out with and you kind of do some dumb things as a kid. And I feel like playing drums kind of kept me out of that as much as I, you know, you know. And, and then from that point on, I, uh, I really wanted to do something in music, you know, and then at Hamilton, uh, the, the school you talked about, right? Yeah, the, uh, they had a you know small MIDI studio, and I, the, you know, David Sears that works for the Academy showed me you know a few things here and there, and I, I fell in love with it, and I and I thought at fifteen I discovered what mixing was, and I remember clearly what that you know, and I said this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I didn't even know if it, I didn't think it was a career either, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. So the drumming, did was that a school program? How did you get into that to start with? You know, so like my family, you know, there's always, there was always someone playing music. You know, it was always like some, you know, whether it's drums, guitar, sax. So my aunt plays classical piano a lot of times. So I was, I was, I was around music a lot. Okay. Uh, so I think that just, that's where it came from. Um, so yeah, mu- definitely a musical family from on my dad's side. Um, but it was, you know, uh, again, I just, I, I think it just subconsciously just kept me out of trouble, you know, and being, you know, I, I was a good kid just around bad kids, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Gravitated towards that. Like, oh, you know what? I don't have to go out tonight cause I'm gonna, I gotta practice and I gotta, uh-huh. yeah. I gotta show it. It was a good, good, uh, good way to, for me to get out of certain things that I shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> so, uh, so is your sister, is she musical? Did she start doing, not in the business at all? No, not at all. 
quite the opposite. She works for the court system. <laughs> she had not, oh wow. Yeah, so she's uh, not a single. Yeah, completely the opposite. You know, nature nurture and all that, but completely yeah. the opposite. Uh, same household. Um, but yeah, I'm probably the only in the family that really pursued music. You know. Mm hmm. And what about your kids? Thankfully, thankfully, they're not. <laughs> they're. Uh, <laughs> They're both, you know, my, my oldest, he's a really, he's an artist. He, uh, artist is a visual artist, but also uh, mm -hmm. his own clothing line. He helps me at the restaurant a lot. He's going to school for business. So, you know, I, he, he realizes being a businessman is a good thing. So he's, uh, uh -huh. he's uh, going to school for that. And my youngest, he likes capturing content, video content. I don't uh -huh. know if it's a, a passion of his, but he likes doing it and he also uh he's going to high uh he's a senior in high school he's uh he's going to uh to business school as well so you know i think they just see me i mean dinner you know we'll have dinner i always talk about hopefully being a good business person you know uh and i think that's just kind of you know it's it's working not that it was that i was planning on it but they're definitely seeing a different side of, you know, and the business side of things. And they always talk about business. I always talk about savings, and this, and p and L's, and <laughs> balance sheets, and flash reports. And they're like, ah. Yeah. And so I, I, I tell them, look, it's whatever you do, whatever, follow your passion. But as long as you know the business side, right, you'll figure yeah. it out eventually. You know? you'll yeah. Because you need the same things in business, whatever career path you choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. So let's get back to your mixing. So your credits, they read like the best of the best. So and it's just such a wide range of people. So you have Santana, Notorious B I G, Group Love, Little Big Town, John Batiste. And that's just in twenty twenty one. Okay. So uh, do you purposefully choose such diverse projects? You know, maybe not anymore, but uh, at some point in my career, I would. You know, I, uh, I I would tell my manager that I, you know, if I was doing all R and B, I'm like, man, you gotta, we gotta go and get some rock records or alternative records. Because you didn't want to be pigeonholed, is that? Yeah. What you know, you know, every, every time uh, we talk about you know careers and do things like this, it, you're you're constantly reminded that. We got into this industry because we love music. I mean, not mm -hmm. because we wanted to make money or wanted to get the hot girl or wanted, you know, or wanted. You may have played part in it though, right? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I wish I was that smart. But, <laughs> uh, I think that it was just you know we 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 sometimes forget why we got into this, right? I didn't get to, into this to have a CL one B, although it's nice, but. The equipment is secondary. The plugins, mm -hmm. they didn't have plugins back then, but the plugins, plugins are secondary. So I always got to remind myself that you know we're still music fans. You know, we're still, I'm still right. a music fanatic. I love music. I can't live without it. I have it all the time. And and I sometimes I'm more of a music fan than others. And I just constantly remind myself to listen for inspiration and. And I think that's really, really important for all of us to be constantly reminded of that. I've talked to a lot of people, and not just on the podcast, but in general um, at my events. And it, it seems to me there are a lot of people who don't, like, like I talked to the uh, the head of audio post at a facility in L.A. And I said, so what, what are your favorite movies? He said, I'll go to movies. Mm -hmm. I talked to a front of house guy who does live sound, I, what, you know. What what do you listen to? I don't listen to music when I'm not working. <laughs> and it just seems like it's prevalent. It's like there's so many people that are in the industry that just want to separate themselves from it yeah. and take a little break, mm. you know, and, and try to regroup and come back. But for you, it seems like you get inspired again listening. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's to me, it's like, like you know, it's like a drug. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you just got to when you have it, you got to have more of it. I mean. Thankfully, I don't do drugs, but uh, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> um, so I think that, I mean, the biggest challenge for us is just honestly just being inspired, just because it's so yeah. easy to have a routine. You know, mm -hmm. we got that front of house guy that doesn't listen to music. 
he should because he's going to end up just doing it out of, just out of necessity and he's going to be resentful at some point in his, in his career he's going to be that guy that we always that we all know and we just don't necessarily want to be around with because he's a little bitter or whatever mm -hmm. and I, I i'm very very conscious of that i i never want to be that guy you know i mean i think i'll go freaking open open up a gardening service uh, company or something. So I don't know what I would do. <laughs> Just look, look at my plants, overgrown plants. I'm like, oh, I should cut those. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, maybe not gardening then. Maybe not gardening. No, no. Maybe uh, move to Guatemala and retire. I don't, I don't know. I think that we have to have that inspiration. And I think that people... One thing that I have noticed as well is nobody wants to be stuck with them. Not that he's an asshole, but someone that doesn't see a positive outlook in their baby. Like, imagine, like, to me, when someone calls me, I, I, I joke that I'm a very expensive babysitter uh, because they're handing me their baby and I got to take care of this, their baby. Right. Nobody wants to hand their baby to someone that, that you know they're not going to take care of their baby. So, so I take that very, you know, I still take it very seriously and it's still a, an, an honor if someone asks me to you know, take care of their baby. So you can't be that guy, you know, you can't be. Right. So I do, if anyone asks for advice, listen to, put some playlists together of things that really, and I, you know, spend an hour and put a playlist together and, and listen to it while you're, you know, while you're depressed or up or down, whatever, whatever. And it puts you in the right frame of mind because as you know, it's, it's, you know, the other example, I, I, the, uh, like the Olympics is, Hundred, you know, hundred yards uh, dash, and everyone has the same body type, right? They're all they all mm -hmm. look almost the same, right? Yeah, they're all yeah. everyone's stretching. They're very focused, right? So it's it's a game of inches, right? It's uh physically they're all almost the same, but why is one person faster than the other, right? At that point, I feel like it's a mindset, you know. It's like, um, and you're training. They're training their bodies, but they're also training their mind. Right? Mm -hmm. you're like that's like it go that's like with anything you got to really train your mind to to you know to be prepared for any scenario and um and so so I, so that goes back to listening to music and being a music fan if your mind is not there because you're just not a fan anymore then people are going to notice that and they're just not going to mm -hmm. call you or you're going to get the crappy jobs, the ones that you didn't want or don't want. Right. You know, and then you're going to be a little, you're going to be miserable and bitter and you're going to talk smack about other people, how they suck. I mean, next thing, you know, you be, next thing you know, you become that guy. Right. And nobody likes that guy. Yeah. So I go, I take the dogs out early. Well, not right now because it's been too cold and dark in the morning, but I'm always listening to music when I'm out mm -hmm. walking. Um, and I've had some of the stuff I've done since the pandemic have been things that have inspired, I've been inspired while I've been out walking. So it's a combination of being out in nature and whatever is playing in my head, whatever music. And I just do a shuffle. I've got just mm -hmm. I've all different types of music, but it's so, it's so amazing to me that you can hear a song. And first of all, there's that ability to transport you back to wherever you were when you originally heard it, but also that it can just make you feel so much better. Yeah. Yeah. about everything or inspire you to to be creative in all aspects of your life yeah you know like when you're in a funk right I mean, and we all get in those you know, yeah life i mean that's the one thing i try to do i try to remember a song that puts me right back to that moment like you described and man it's amazing it's like and that's why i said it's like a drug because it's you don't need any any you know like you can literally go to the songs that make you happy and you can play them and all of a sudden you Gets you out of that funk, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a huge Frank Sinatra fan. I've always been a mm. huge Frank Sinatra fan. And my youngest kid, who is 25, um, we he was always in the car last because he was the youngest. And so I always used to play Frank Sinatra. And I so appreciate the fact that he loves Frank Sinatra. He's 25. He listens to all this other stuff. He tells me about it too. But he so understands yeah. what was happening with that music. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so I wonder if he just remembers subconsciously listening to it while you were, and then just triggered something from you know, it's, it could, it be. Be, could be as powerful as that. I remember playing songs uh, when my kid, my kids are like little babies, and 
and uh and they subconsciously remember some of that when yeah you play again you know so that's i it's, mean that's how powerful music is right yeah yeah it's so so cool um so you've won 10 grammys you've um you've been nominated for 23 um <laughs> uh, I, yeah, lose, I have a losing uh, percent. <laughs> hey, you're almost half. I think that's pretty good. Um, was that a goal when you first started? Did you ever think, oh, if I win a Grammy, then oh, that's no. the be all end all? No, no, not even close. It's funny because I, I was sitting next to Serban, one of the Grammys, and, uh -huh. and I, I did, funny enough, is he's like the one that told me about my first Grammy before I knew what it was. You know, <laughs> meaning uh, we were there. He's like. He, he 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 was clapping and stood up. He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, you know, congrats, congrats. Like, yeah, man, this is great. And like, and then uh, and then I I think Alicia, somebody won the Grammy that day, uh, that night. And I was like, yeah, man, she won. Like, oh, congrats. You. I'm like, well, I don't get it. It's like, no, what are you talking? About? You you worked on the the whole album or the majority of it? Oh yeah, I worked on the whole album. It's like, well, you know, if you get 51 percent or more on the category, you win a Grammy. I'm like. Get the fuck out of here! No way, really. So then I started thinking back, and I had already won. <laughs> I even know the the rules. Right? <laughs> so I was just there, long for the ride. And uh, Grammys was not even, you know. Listen, I, I, when you're deep in it, that's the last thing that I think about. But it's funny because as soon as you win one and you see it in your living room, you're like, "Oh, that, that's that that looks nice." <laughs> they're pretty. They're pretty awards. So where do you have your ten Grammys? Where, where do I have them? Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I used to have them in my bedroom. <laughs> I'm like, you know, they were deep and no one, you know, it's in the bedroom when no one can see them. So uh, now, now I've moved them to a, a, a part of the living room that no one sees either. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm a buyer, not a seller, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. so I'm not, even when you come through Laird, you'll see that. I mean, Laird has been around for, for a long, long time. I mean, we could, the amount of plaques that could be on the walls. Yeah. You know, it would be, we could flex, but when you walk through the hallway, it's, it's all art. It's all visual art. And, it's, yeah. uh, and I always, well, a beautiful studio. Oh, thank you. And, yeah, yeah. It's intended to be just more about the creation than the, uh, than the flex, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I guess that's the, uh, the bottom line is I, I, I don't want to flex. I just want to make sure that we keep creating in my mind. Mm -hmm. Why I don't, you know, I don't think about Grammys or any of that stuff. Don't get me so, wrong. I say Grammys are for my grandkids. I, I hope that my grandkids someday will, will say, man, grandpa was a badass. You know, that's <laughs> a, <laughs> so I'm like, well, let's get more Grammys for the grandkids someday. Yeah. That's really funny. So when you're about to start a, a mix, is there, do you have some kind of ritual before you start? Yeah. You know, I listen to the rough. I mean, we're, we're in the world of roughs for better or worse. Some roughs are really bad. <laughs> Other roughs are actually really good. Uh -huh. Like, ooh, what am I gonna do? Uh, so I, I listen to the rough, and I make. I used to make write notes on it. Now I just make mental notes on what I think could be better, and I also mm -hmm. listen to what is good that I'm not gonna change. You know, so I so I start with that, and then I start pushing faders. I'm still on the console. I'm still, you know, one of the, the last guys I think that's actually still on the desk and uh, uh -huh. and I started perform not performing but I started bringing faders up I have a system where I know where my drums are my vocals my effects my synths guitars so I kind of reach for them knowing that you know my, I have a great group of guys that help me set it up and then I start pushing faders start EQing I start looking at my gain structure is going to be which is in the world of you know, today's world being gain structures, everything, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, um, I see what you know. Sometimes you know, I get their session, and I see what they've done to some of their sounds, and I, and I, I, I think if it's a Sonic, uh, if they did it for Sonic reasons, and I sometimes I take it off, but if it's a production call, then I leave it off. So for example, if there's a delay, creative delay, I don't take that plugin off because it's part of production. But mm -hmm. if someone tries to EQ a kick. Um, then I take it off because I'll probably do my own processing. Uh -huh. so, so that's the way I kind of see it. As, that's why I like getting the sessions as they finish them because that, you know, for me it's like someone running and passing the baton, you know, because uh, I got I got fresh legs. So. Right, right. <laughs> they, they just ran 400 meters. Right? 
So uh, my job is to take the baton and hopefully take it to, you know, across the finish line. You know? So I, I know it seems like everything is based on singles now, right? So it's yeah. individual tracks. But yeah. if you can see everything together, a lot of times there's a story, right? So from beginning to end. Yeah. And you're supposed to listen to it to a certain way, but not that that happens a whole bunch anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing just a couple of tracks on an album, mm -hmm. is it hard to find that flow and that storytelling ability? Yeah, you know, like, like what you said, sometimes nowadays albums are not what they used to be as far as yeah. from beginning to end. So I don't know if it matters as much, especially now in the TikTok. Yeah, yeah. well, that's true. So uh, I think we just, I, I, I think we focus on what's in front of us, that, that, right. that, that, that emotion or, you know, whether you want to make some 14 year old girl dance on TikTok so that your song blows up and that's what it is. And that's what it is. So we, I don't think I need to hear what comes before that song or after that song too. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it is what it is. Right. Right. But I love working on albums. I mean, there's an album I'm currently working on where it is a, it's a collection of songs, right? Mm -hmm. And those are interesting. And, and it's crazy because that's what we used to do so much. And now it's like, we don't do that as much. Right. It becomes almost harder nowadays to, to do that, you know, which is so, so wild. Is it strange to, when you're doing just a couple of tracks and you hear all the different tracks that are all on an album, it, there's got to be other mixers who have different takes on what's going. So mm -hmm. is it strange to, when you're listening to it, it's like, oh, this isn't what I would have done, or this is really different, or this is kind of cool that they did it this way. I, you know, it's so funny because I never do that. I don't think I've ever done that. I, I, I am the, you know, I'm so not judgmental with, with other folks' mixes, or I judge maybe productions a little more because yeah. I'm inspired by productions. But as far as, like, I would have done this or I wouldn't have done it that way, I I, I don't think I've ever done that. You know, I listen to things. Uh, uh, I listen to things with, with, um, yeah, just an open mind, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, and that's how, uh, hopefully I learn from it. You know? I think being a mix engineer for you must be an interesting experience. So, um, because you, you do such a variety of music, what are you, what kind of qualities are you looking for in someone that you hire as your assistant? You know, uh, I always say, <laughs> don't be an asshole <laughs> that's a good um, one <laughs> um i think the uh the like the technical part of it they can learn eventually i can teach mm -hmm. them that over time uh i just want someone that wants to be in the room you know but not everyone wants to be in the room but i'm talking about like someone that really has a deep deep uh connection with the art form right because everybody wants to do it for some reason but not everybody has it in them uh, meaning that they do it for the wrong reasons, right? So right. I think my goal is always to hire people that that are, just have good personalities, that they don't, the e ego definitely not engage. Um, and unfortunately, I've had a couple of assistants that have had big egos and they haven't really worked out. But then I've had amazing, amazing assistants that are, that have no ego and uh, they want to learn, they want to go the extra mile, they want to work hard. So work ethic, personality, you know, all that, all that stuff. The moment someone says, well, the way I do it, things, and the, the, the moment they start using words like that, I'm like, the flag. <laughs> it's like, like ah, maybe, maybe that's not the right personality. Hey, listen, I know other mixers. I love that those personalities. And I'm just not, you know, not, I, that's not what I'm looking for. Yeah, I kind of like peace and harmony in my workplace. You have to. and no egos. Yeah, you have. Listen, life is way too short, and the fact that they're paying us to do what we love. I mean, come on, we're what's, yeah. uh, we're, we're some of the luckiest people in the world, right? Right, and and you seem to be a good example for people to look up to because, like, for me with events, so I have a staff, and um, there's some tables, like it's cocktail tables, that people have empty glasses and stuff. I'll go clean them up. Yeah. Oh. It, because why would I do something I don't expect? Yeah, you know. So I try to lead by example. Listen, I uh, <laughs> first what was, 
on any given night, I mean, I'm busting tables. I'm mixing, yeah. you know, uh, you know, mixing Lizzo next door with with Mark Ronson, and uh-huh. in between takes because I need, <laughs> need a near break. I'm go. I'm busting tables. You know, <laughs> a humbling experience. You know, but I I roll up the sleeves, and I'm never yeah. too like big i mean sunday yesterday we had an event at burst i was there moving tables at one in the morning you know so look for me it's and i don't see it as oh man i gotta do this i'm hey whatever whatever it takes it's you know let's get it done and yeah let's go you know my kids were helping me like yesterday at one in the morning Mm -hmm. so yeah you never should be too high on yourself to not be too good to do something like that right right especially if it's your business. You know? Right. So what kind of um, things do your mix and assistants get to do? And is it just, do they start off getting coffee for you? I mean, what's no, the process? No, I don't think, I, I don't know. Who, I don't remember the last time someone got coffee for me. Uh, but, you know, so I have a, you know, prepping sessions today. I mean, we should do a, a podcast just on that one, one day, because it's like the lost, art form of just prepping for mixes mm-hmm. you know? um so they spend they could spend days getting the session prep because what happens a lot of the time is they'll send files that are not the files that i'm supposed to be mixing so uh they have to kind of go on you know they call the producer label mm-hmm. and oh my gosh some sessions you know you can imagine so they take a lot of time to prep. So once it's prepped, once it's ready to be mixed, this is the, I got the best job in the world. I just show up and start throwing faders up. You know, I don't, I don't have to deal with bad edits, bad fades, or this or that. So that's what they do a lot of the time. Once I'm done with the mix, once I'm like, okay, let's send this, or you know, let's send this over. They'll print stamps, and they'll take it'll take them a couple of hours to print stamps. You know. And once they do that, um, you know, we'll have, I have one guy that, you know, I, I get a page of notes or three notes or 10 notes, whatever that. Uh-huh. So if it's a uh, <clears throat> bring the vocal up half a dB, then he does it for me. Uh, but if it's a conceptual change, like, oh, make it sound like the South of France, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. and, uh, then I go in and I do those notes, but then I still listen to all the updates and make sure that it's the quality control. And. So one of my guys does that for me. The other mm-hmm. one will do edits, uh, assets. Now with they'll be you know with Admos, everyone mm-hmm. assets right away. So that means that we got to reprint all these stems to send to the label, and and then clean versions and radio edits, and there's so much of that, you know. And and uh, I'm lucky enough to have guys that that, that do that for, for me. And that's why people are like, how do you do a restaurant and mix? Oh, the great thing about it is I just mix. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I just, I just well, don't have to prep or do anything. I, so that's a, I'm blessed, blessed to be able to have that, that, you know, that system in place. You know? Well, it seems like you work 24 seven anyway, so I don't know how you would find more time. Yeah. Oh man. It's, yeah. Need a vacation from a vacation. <laughs> I just had one. I'm like, what am I talking about? Yeah. <laughs> So you've done my speed mentoring when you're not working. Um, you're now a mentor with Jam Card. Uh, you do the mix with the masters. Mm-hmm. You always seem to be giving back. So I try. And it seems like you've done that for a really long time. Yeah, you know, it's uh again, as you know, finding the time is uh it's a challenge, especially with the restaurant, because it's uh even if I do have that time, I know that I can spend that time putting fires out you know so Mm -hmm. even if my calendar looks like there's a gap here that gap is probably taken already by the restaurant (laughs) so um you know uh if i do find the time i want to be able to give back somehow you know whether it's um you know yeah just somehow whether it's me talking to someone and maybe helping them and just uh, putting them in the right frame of mind not necessarily teaching them how to mix because i don't think right right yeah but just, there's so much more to you know, everything than just the mixing part, like yeah. you were talking about earlier. Yeah, you know, a lot of people ask about balance, like life and, and your career. I mean, I, Do you I, have any balance? You know, it's funny because my son that's working at the restaurant, right? 
he he worked like 60 plus hours at the restaurant last week and i'm talking to him on saturday i'm like hey man you gotta try to balance some stuff out right and he's looking at me like do you balance i'm like yeah, <laughs> funny enough that i actually kind of do my own way and i'll tell you <clears throat> maybe on a daily basis it's not the same balance that other people have mm-hmm. but i always have a calendar and i always have that red x you know and every four to six weeks there's always a getaway like so i always said i'm going to take two vacations and when i when i say vacation like two and a half weeks per year so i'm going to take mm-hmm. two but in between every four to six weeks, we're going to do two, three day getaways. So <clears throat> to me, that's a balance because we're so, you know, we're grinding, grinding, grinding. And, but we always see the calendar. It's like, oh, I got 10 days left right. or I kind of just do, you know, balance it out. So, so is it balanced the way it's maybe a doctor or other profession? Maybe not, but is it balanced in the sense that I take time off and, appreciate like you talked about nature you have to appreciate nature you have to do all those things to still be creative and still have some you know some fuel in the tank when you get back so refuel, you know you got to refuel the tank right refuel, you know, the tank but uh i feel like that's my version of like balance like uh traveling and making sure that you come back inspired you know okay where's your favorite place to go my favorite place in the world, San Sebastian in the Basque in Spain. Yeah, uh, I gotta say, I travel a lot and that's still my favorite place. Uh, food, culture, weather, you got the sea, the mountains, I mean, or, I mean, it's, it's, it's every wine regions, uh, culture, you got France 10 minutes away, you got, yeah. so that's a beautiful part of and they always, uh, you know, when they finish lunch, it's funny because the Spaniards, when they're done with lunch, they're already talking about dinner, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good culture. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So when you're doing all these different mentoring programs, what kind of advice are you giving to the students? Because like we said, it's not necessarily about technique and mixing, but it's the because since I'm not in the room for speed mentoring, I don't know specifically what they ask you. But when mentors tell me, it seems more just like like you're saying a work life balance and just more dealing with life mm-hmm. in this business. So, what kind of advice do you give out? I ask. I do a lot. I do, you know, a few questions before. You know, I give any sort of advice because mm-hmm. uh, again, that each individual may have, you know, some of them want to know what I, what I used on Whitney Houston in night in 2005 backgrounds for this specific song. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't even remember that song, <laughs> but uh, some of them want to know specifics and others want to know, again, like we said, balance between work and, you know, life. And some want to know how I got into the business and how I did my hours. Some people want to know, Hey, what's your day like? What, what time yeah. do you do it? So I, I, I try to ask questions and then they'll, I'll know what they want to learn from me. And a lot of the time, it's not necessarily a technical issue or mm-hmm. a issue, but a technical thing. Uh, most of the time, it's just, hey, industry, like this is a tough industry to get into. How did you do it? You know? Right. And, and then when they ask me something like that, I, then I ask them yet another, I, I answer with a question, you know, and to get, to get more information on how I can really, really help them out. Because, right. I, you know, I feel like a lot of the times, uh, like say mix with the masters, for, this is a good example. They, um, you know, there's a lot of talented engineers there. I mean, really, really talented. And I feel like they don't need to learn how to mix or, or not, or anything. They just need, it's like having writer's block, you know, like mm-hmm. you need someone to say, Dude, you're you're actually doing really well. What you have to do is get your mind right and give you a boost of confidence because you're going through this mixer's block right now. Right. And uh, it seems like the majority of the questions are about that. Oh, not not questions. The majority of the mentees want and need just just a little inspiration. Yeah. Okay. And then um, if someone wants to be you. <laughs> they're student, they're graduating. They want to be Manny American. Mm-hmm. What kind of qualities do you think they need to have to try to achieve what you've been able to achieve in your career? 
you know, I mean, there's so many things that I think you have to have, right? Uh, there's a lot, but, and, and I feel like any creative career, right? Not just mixing, but right. like I just said, you know, I think that you got to just be a student of the game, you know, uh, no matter how many hits or Grammys that, that we talk, it doesn't, none of that matters for your next song. None of it, mm-hmm. matters, right? Uh, now, if I was a doctor, if I had performed 25 years of surgeries, then you want to come to me because you know, I right. have experience in that. As a mixer, no, you're only as good. Rose would always say this. You're only as good <laughs> as the client and you're only as good as your last hit. Right. And I live by those words, you know, so so you, I think what you have to have is you have to you have to be passionate about it. Your work ethic has to be just you just got to put all all of you into it you can't do it part-time you gotta mm-hmm. commit to a, a career some people are not ready for that uh and you and you got to be curious about different emotional connections on on sounds and frequencies and stuff like that because what we're trying to do is we're trying to hopefully um what's with what's been given to us we want to find that emotional connection that the listener's going to have that with that song right. uh, you notice there's certain mixers that have constantly are you read their credits and they have hits right there's mm-hmm. something about them that they know how to like maybe guess what that emotional connection is going to be yeah. on a deeper level right right so i think you have to have all those things you have to be humble you got a work ethic you have to be hungry you have to keep learning you have to be a sponge you can't think you know it all um and, and, and there's so many more, but I think those are really some of the you know, more important ones in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you just got to be a nice kid. Some of these kids are kind of clueless at times. And I don't know if it's nature, nurture, like we said, but I don't know if it's, the you know, whatever it is. Um, I feel it's just being, uh, just wanting to be in the room. And I know it's everybody wants to be in the room, but not everybody deserves to be on the bed. Right. No, it's my my youngest, who is a baker now and doing very well. Nice. He told me when he was like 17 or 18, because he sees what I do. He says, oh, I want to be an engineer. And I said, no. And he <laughs> said, what do you mean? No. And I said, well, okay, here's the deal. You're not going to make any money. Mm-hmm. You're going to be working all the time. Mm-hmm. And you don't have the passion that you need to be successful in any way. Because he loves music. Yeah. So he said, okay. And now he is in his, you know, baking is his passion. Yeah, that's amazing. So you gave you can't, the right advice. <laughs> it, you know, sometimes it happens, not always as a parent. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I think you have to have that. Not everybody does. You might be, like you're saying, technically they may be perfect, but if they don't have the passion, I think it, you just don't get everything mm-hmm. in your mix or as an engineer, any of that. You know, it's funny because you're you have a lot of technical engineers out there that but they have zero people skills yeah and then you have the complete opposite i've there's some guys that are very charming that are not very good at what they do and but yet they're in the room so that just shows you that you have to have a combination of like you know you gotta have you gotta be very well balanced with all those so that right that artist producer manager can actually be in the room with you not on Zoom call in the last couple of years, at least. Right, yeah. You know? But you got to be able to interact in a way that you're still professional and still, you know, and they still want to call you back. So it's like right. one half, the other half is like, I always say, when the music comes out of those speakers, there's no personality or any of that stuff. So that's half of it, you know? So you got to mm. have maybe a little bit of talent or your gut has to kind of lead you in a certain way, but also right. the technical side, you know, you also got to obviously understand that. Right. And, uh, some people don't have it. Yeah. So uh, everything I've been doing probably for my entire career in this industry, it, but more specifically in the last couple of years, has been trying to keep this pro audio community t- together because I really love the people yeah. in this industry. So um, I ask everybody I talk to, what does community mean to you? Some people talk about their family. Some talk about mm-hmm. friends. Some talk about industry. So what does that, what's that mean for you? You know, especially in the audio community, uh, I think Dave Pensado has been great at, uh, at uh, you know, him and I would have these these talks at Laird at 2.30 in the morning about, you know, 
him being a great mentor, a great teacher. He's mm-hmm. got a teacher mentality, uh, which is great because not I think ninety percent of us don't have that, you know, uh, for for whatever reason. But right. Pensado was one of the first guys that had a platform to be able to share information, right, to the community. And I feel like before that, everyone was like secrets. I'm 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 gonna hold on to my bag of tricks because right. you don't know what I'm doing, right? And I feel like the community, the audio community, has for most of my career has been that, and uh, and I think that they've uh, kind of you know changed the the mentality of like, hey guys, it's okay to kind of sh- share information and mm-hmm. techniques and all that. And for that reason, I feel like we need you, people like you, to kind of be the glue to to it all because none of us none of us are going to do it. Because we, you know, for what, maybe I just said, we're not naturally teachers. We're not naturally like community leaders, you know, uh-huh. we're audio geeks. So an audio geek is not going to get more audio geeks to form this community. <laughs> it's so important, mm-hmm. you know, so we need you in the world of still being, you know, the backbone to a community, because I got to say, it's very important to all of us. All of us, uh, we just don't know h- how to verbalize it. Really, we don't. We don't know how to start this movement of community because, we, again, we're trained to be in this dark room with right them, <laughs> and nobody bothering us. So naturally, we're not going to do it. But we all kind of want to do it. You know, it's, right? It's, it's it's important. Um, and I think that you guys are doing such a great job. I always, you know, doing this these mentor sessions, doing stuff like this. You're very involved. You're becoming a, not not becoming. You've been a, uh, a staple in this, you know, again the backbone to a lot of, you know, a lot of the community. So you're, you know, the question should be <laughs> back to you more than me. <laughs> well, except this is my podcast, and I don't have to answer it. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. So last question. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> last question, and this is my favorite. Um, and I ask everybody, so I'm not a foodie. Everybody I know is a foodie. I mean, if you hang out with Rose, you've experienced most types of food. Um, so this is the question. So we're having dinner together. It could be anywhere you want, even your own restaurant. Mm -hmm. So I want to know what are we eating? What are we drinking? And what are we talking about? Oh, and what kind of music is playing? That's amazing. I don't know why this just came to mind. I would say La Tour d'Argent in Paris. Uh, and it's uh, overlooking the Seine in Notre Dame. And uh, we would be having the duck. And this restaurant is famous for ducks. Uh, they've been open since, the, I think it's 1500 or something. One of the oldest restaurants, and they actually number each duck. So you get a postcard with a number. Uh, <laughs> I think they're at uh, 4 million and something ducks. Oh, God. So, uh-huh. But... They have one of the best psalms in the world. I mean, this guy's got shows about him, books written about him. But we would be probably drinking a nice Bordeaux since we're in France uh, mm-hmm. with a duck. And uh, and just uh, uh, we're listening to some classic French, you know, tunes in the back. And that, that would that would be that would be one of the great meals. Uh, period. Ever. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. And what are we going to be talking about? We're going we're gonna to be talking about culture, you know? We're going to be talking why you said you're not a foodie, but I think we all are foodies to a different extent. And the reason why we're foodies, uh, I, I feel like we appreciate the art form more than anything because mm-hmm. uh, like chefs are like mixers, you know? They, 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 they're the first ones to show up, maybe the last one to leave, but they're very passionate about what they do. Uh, like you said, they don't make a lot of money. Uh, but but yet you keep do putting the same piece of your heart into every dish, and I think that's why I love the art of making uh, chefs and foodies food because there's a level of passion there that I can connect with. And same thing with wine. I mean, it takes you know years and years to perfect this bottle, yeah. so it takes a lot of uh, you know a lot of passion. So I think we I think we would be jumping a conversation would be about culture being in france being in in a place where it gives you life and and, and hopefully more you, you come back more inspired uh, 
uh, to keep doing these podcasts and all, <laughs> the million things that you keep that you're doing. So, so yeah, that's what the conversation will be about. That sounds that sounds amazing. So thank you so much, Manny. Um, this has been great. Thank you.